Hello and a warm welcome to Consulting Without Borders Perspectives. I'm Victoria Olske, your host and moderator for today's show. As the president of the Gabriel Salim Foundation, I am thrilled to be here with you today as we're having our 21st episode of Perspectives. Gabriel Salim Foundation is a US-based nonprofit organization dedicated to celebrating uh, the life and the inspirational work of the late Gabriel Al Salim, uh, who was an international consultant and a global leader. A month ago, on February 1st, Gabriel's birthday, we held our traditional annual event uh, during which we talked about ways to reimagine success and also presented awards to our amazing winners of the International Award for Excellence in Consulting. We had five winners uh, in categories ranging from human rights and youth empowerment to global leadership to environmental responsibility. And uh, you can find out about uh, the winners, their winning projects and their impactful work on the foundation's website right here. Uh, so I hope you're all doing very well today on March 1st, uh, which marks the first day of meteorological spring. And uh, uh, in many countries, it is also uh, celebrated as the first day of spring. Please uh, drop us a comment and let us know where you are tuning in from today. I would be very happy to know uh, where you are coming in today. Please come uh, here and say hello to us. I know that Ron Finch is joining us from Italy. Thank you, Ron, for being here with us today. Also, a huge shout out to those of you who are tuning in to the replay of this episode. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome. Today, we are live on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn and X, Twitter, for, um, former Twitter. So feel free to engage with us by asking questions uh, in the comments. And if you're liking uh, what you're seeing, please hit the like button. It means so much to us and it also helps spread the word about this live stream. Today, uh, we are absolutely delighted to have one of our previous speakers back. Uh, the episode we did with her was exactly a year ago on March 1st of 2023, when we talked about greenwashing. Our guest speaker received her Bachelor of Science degree from Leiden University College, The Hague, majoring in Earth Energy and Sustainability. Uh, and since we spoke last year, uh, she has also completed her Master of Science in the Sustainable Development Program at Utrecht University, also in the Netherlands. Uh, she is also a member of our foundation's board of directors leading our sustainability efforts. Usually she is behind the scenes of the show, handling the technical side, but since she's going to be a speaker, to, a speaker today, uh, I will be doing the technical part. So please bear with me as I'm going through your questions and comments. Today, uh, she's bringing to our episode insights on the growth strategy for the European aviation sector, drawing from her master's thesis research. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Anya Al Salem, my daughter, joining us today live from the Netherlands. Hi, Welcome, thank Anya. So thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for uh, finding the time to share with us uh, the insights about the work that you've done. And as your mom, I know that how much effort you put into that. And I know that it was in the end very successful. Uh, so can you please, well, tell us at this point, how do you feel? Uh, how are you feeling about being a recent graduate of, of the master's program? And what are your plans for the future or nearest future? 
Yeah, I mean, the thesis has been uh, it's been quite a journey um, <clears throat> with with its ups and downs, and I'm really thrilled to be finally uh, done with it. And I had my my presentation uh, a few weeks ago, and I have officially graduated yesterday. That was my official graduation date, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and congratulations! Thank you, thank you. And now I'm in this sort of transition period where I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing next. Uh, I'm looking into various uh, job opportunities, but also potentially maybe going and volunteering um, somewhere. So it's it's quite exciting to to have uh, so many opportunities and to see where where it leads me. Well, this is wonderful. This is a wonderful time uh, in everybody's life when you've done uh, a big chunk of uh, very important work, and now you have all sorts of opportunities ahead of you and. Um, I'm just wishing you, of course, always all the very best as your mom, as your colleague. <laughs> uh, so before uh, we, we move on, uh, maybe you can just start already with the presentation because I don't want to talk too much about this, this very important topic, the growth of aviation. Uh, it is certainly uh, very intriguing because aviation is the mode of transport uh, with a, a very significant climate uh, impact and uh, yet air travel continues to grow. And I know you've uh, done quite a bit of research uh, in this sector specifically and used some uh, interesting uh, methodological approach. So please uh, start sharing with us uh, all of your insights and findings. And for those who are watching us, please, uh, Start putting your questions in the comments and we will address them uh, after Anya's presentation. Yeah, so I will start sharing my presentation. Um, can you see uh, the presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. So please just let me know if at any point uh, it stops, the slides stop uh, changing or anything, but uh, hopefully we don't have any technical difficulties. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to share the findings of my research with you and to talk more about this really important topic of degrowth of aviation. Um, so in my research, I, uh, as I will discuss later, I aim to develop strategic policy recommendations for degrowth of aviation based on a systems thinking approach, which I will elaborate on later on. But first, uh, just for some context, I'd like to start by saying that according to recent research, Average global temperatures are projected to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels as early as 2033, which is already less than a decade away. And warming above 1.5 degrees would cause unprecedented and potentially irreversible damage to human societies and natural ecosystems. This is why in the coming decade, it is critical to make rapid and significant reductions in CO2 emissions. Now, the dominant policy response to climate change centers on the idea of green growth, which is the idea that technological innovation will allow us to decouple uh, GDP growth from CO2 emissions. However, research shows that this is unlikely to occur at a global scale rapidly enough to prevent warming over 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius, which is why we need to look towards alternative approaches to climate change mitigation. Now, this brings us to the idea of degrowth, which is a growing social movement and academic field calling for a democratically deliberated absolute reduction of material and energy throughput, which uh, consequently ensures well-being for all within planetary boundaries. So as you can see in this uh, graph, uh, degrowth advocates for moving towards a quote unquote steady state economy that respects planetary boundaries and is not dependent on economic growth. Now, while degrowth calls for an economy-wide transformation, uh, in my research, I chose to focus on the aviation sector due to its high levels of projected growth and limited technological solutions for rapidly mitigating the uh, sector's climate impacts. Now, to illustrate how the sector is growing, um, I, I'm pulling up a figure from uh, a recent publication by the International Air Transport Association, which projects a 3.4% uh, compounded annual growth rate in global air passengers up to 2040. Now, while emissions from global aviation currently account for about 3% of global CO2 emissions, 
The share of emissions from aviation is growing rapidly, and there is some research that suggests that emissions from international aviation may reach a share of 22% of global CO2 emissions by 2050. So this is definitely an important area of focus for climate change mitigation. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, aircraft emit other substances other than CO2 that yield a climate impact that can be up to three times worse than CO2 alone. Now, uh, the Waypoint 2050 report, which you can see here, uh, the cover page of, which was published by the Air Transport Action Group, sets out a pathway for the global aviation sector to reach net zero CO2 emissions by 2050, while continuing to grow the total amount of aviation activity. And uh, the measures proposed in this report are based on four main categories, uh, which are technological improvements, such as the development of hybrid or electric aircraft, operations and infrastructure, sustainable aviation fuel, and carbon offsetting. However, uh, independent research suggests that the green growth measures proposed in Waypoint 2050 are unlikely to contribute to a rapid reduction in aviation emissions, and it is essential to reduce the absolute amount of aviation activity, at least in the short term, to effectively mitigate the sector's climate impacts. And here on this slide, I'm highlighting two key reports, which were really foundational to my own research, and um, I'd like to ask my mom to please uh, share the links to these reports because I think they're, uh, yeah, really great to look at. Um, the first of which is the Degrowth of Aviation report published in 2019 by Stay Grounded, which is a grassroots network campaigning for degrowth of aviation, which states that reducing the absolute amount of aviation activity is the only way to achieve a rapid and socially just decarbonization of the aviation sector. Uh, and the second report is titled The Roadmap to Climate Neutral Aviation in Europe, which was published in 2022 by the NGO Transport and Environment. Uh, and it says that demand management, uh, so a reduction in demand, is the most effective means to reducing emissions from aviation this decade. Now, this brings me to my own research. Uh, the aim of my research was to develop strategic policy recommendations for degrowth of aviation. And in my research, I adopted a systems thinking approach. Uh, and systems thinking refers to making sense of a complex issue by looking at it in terms of holes and relationships rather than splitting it down into its parts. Uh, and hopefully later on in the presentation, I'll make it a bit clearer for those who are unfamiliar with this approach, how it actually looks in practice. So in order to fulfill my research aim, I uh, had two main steps in my research. The first of which was developing a map of the aviation system where I identified key factors and processes that are currently driving the growth of aviation, uh, thereby providing, providing a comprehensive overview of the issue. And as the second uh, step of my research, I used this map that I developed in the first step to identify key policy intervention points for degrowth of aviation. As for my methods, I uh, conducted 25 expert interviews with experts uh, in degrowth of aviation, as well as uh, representatives of the sector itself. And I also conducted a participatory expert workshop. And the scope of my research, uh, because I had to yeah, have a bit of a narrower scope than all of aviation, uh, so I focused on European commercial passenger aviation. However, I would expect that many of the findings uh, in my research uh, could be applicable to other parts of the world as well. Now, uh, I am uh, presenting the map of the aviation system that I developed in my research, and uh, I am aware of how chaotic it is, so please do not worry. I'm not expecting anybody to uh, be able to understand everything just by looking at it, but um, I just wanted to show this to show the complexity of the issue. So. This is a causal loop diagram, which is one of the tools of systems thinking um, that is used for mapping a complex issue. And, it, and in this particular case, um, this causal loop diagram shows the different variables and causal relationships that are driving the growth in aviation activity. Um, so this map is quite useful because you can uh, see how intervening in one part of the system, so for example, changing one of the variables, um, would affect other parts of the system or even the behavior of the system as a whole. And this is uh, very useful for strategic policy planning, for example, around degrowth policies. Um, so after developing this uh, 
causal loop diagram, I uh, used the causal relationships and feedback loops in this uh, diagram to identify key policy intervention points, which I am highlighting here. So the key policy intervention points that I identified are first, airline ticket prices, and second, aviation industry lobbying. So just to give a little bit of an idea of why these were the ones that I selected, so in, in, in identifying the key policy intervention points, uh, points, I aimed to look for variables that seem to play a key role in explaining the behavior of the system. So ones that um, where if you intervene on the variable, it would have significant effects on different parts of the system. Um, so this, these are variables with high system change potential. Uh, however, I also was looking for the variables that would uh, are relatively accessible. So those with relatively low socio-political and physical barriers to intervention. Um, and this is why, uh, based on these criteria, I came up with these two uh, key policy intervention points, which I will elaborate on in the next uh, slides. So as I mentioned, the first of the uh, policy intervention points is uh, airline ticket prices. And uh, this stems from the fact that flying is currently very cheap, uh, largely due to tax exemptions of the sector and also the rise of low cost carriers. So in general, the aviation sector is undertaxed and benefits greatly from state funding. This is due to various historical factors. Um, also, I thought it was interesting that one of my interview participants talked about the nationalistic pride associated with airlines a lot of the time, which sort of um, explains why they would benefit from state funding. Uh, additionally, the rise of low-cost carriers has introduced greater competition to the aviation market, uh, lowering the prices of, of air travel overall. And so as airline ticket prices get cheaper, the demand for aviation grows because flying becomes more accessible. Uh, now, there are various policies to increase airline ticket prices. Uh, so there are various taxation measures such as a kerosene tax, value-added tax, carbon tax, and ticket tax. Um, and I would like to highlight one policy measure in particular that recurred throughout the interviews that I conducted, which is a frequent flyer levy, which basically says that each flight taken within a given period uh, becomes progressively more expensive, which would then incentivize uh, fewer flights. And this is a particularly um, appealing uh, measure because it is more socially just than regular taxation measures uh, because it targets frequent flyers who contribute the most to aviation emissions while sparing somebody who might fly to see their family once every two years, for example. So personally, I would advocate for a measure such as a frequent flyer levy in order to um, address uh, airline ticket prices that are too low. Um, so the second leverage or uh, key intervention point, also uh, what I refer to in my thesis as leverage points, is aviation industry lobbying. Um, so there has been research by the independent think tank uh, called Influence Map that shows that regulatory bodies that are sort of uh, intended to actually regulate the aviation industry are highly influenced by aviation industry lobbying. So Influence Map found that the European aviation sector is one of the most negative in terms of climate policy engagement and is a powerful opponent of climate regulation. And also at the international level, the aviation industry has a, a large influence over the United Nations International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, where there are also some uh, concerning transparency practices. So one of my interview participants suggested um, the introduction of an EU level law that would increase the transparency of meeting data between aviation industry representatives and policymakers in order to try to counter some of the, uh, the lobbying efforts that are uh, taking place to uh, decrease the stringency of regulation of the industry. Now, this leads me to uh, a few key conclusions of my research. The first of which, as I just explained, airline ticket prices and aviation industry lobbying present strategic entry points for degrowth policies for aviation. And the causal loop diagram that I developed, which I'm also happy to come back to if anybody has questions about, uh, offers a tool for strategic policy development for degrowth of aviation. And finally, thinking more broadly, systems thinking can contribute to the development of degrowth strategies in other sectors as well. Uh, so I think this is a very useful tool in thinking about uh, degrowth strategies as it provides a comprehensive uh, overview of an issue and really helps identify where we'd like to focus our efforts for degrowth. 
Uh, so that brings me to the end of my presentation, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that might have come up during the presentation. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen so I can see the comments again. Thank you so much, Anya. Yeah, we had a few comments, and yeah, thank you to Dawn for joining us today. She was commenting uh, along um, as you were talking. Thank you uh, for joining us. Always a pleasure. And uh, as we are actually, we already have uh, some questions coming in. So maybe, yeah, Ron, thank you. Um, it's, uh, I guess it's more like a comment that Ron is posting about uh, lobbying bodies. You can see Anya. Yeah. yeah. Um... It, um, indeed, yeah. I think uh, lobbying is, is a general issue, and I, I would really, if, if anybody's interested in, in the uh, corporate influence over climate policy in general, I would really recommend uh, checking out Influence Map, as I uh, mentioned in my presentation. They, they, they look at the aviation sector, but also all sorts of different sectors, um, and they really uh, try to call out industries that are uh, negatively influencing climate climate policy and I think that's already a, a great first step in in countering some of the negative uh, lobbying that is happening but I agree it's it's really a major issue um, yeah so I see a question from uh, Don about American Airlines and other airlines increasing their baggage prices um, well I think this is uh, actually just another way of, of to some extent uh, decreasing um, to some extent, I think this is this is a way of actually decreasing airline ticket prices uh, because um, it makes flying without baggage, I guess, uh, relatively cheaper. I, I'm not particularly familiar with this with this measure. I think maybe it's uh, something that's happening more in the U.S., which I was looking into. But um, uh, I, I also think these these sorts of measures are, are quite. Um, uh, you know, incremental. And I think something I also wanted to mention about airline ticket prices and just the cost of flying in general, I think in order for it to uh, really change demand, it has to be significant enough uh, in order to actually stop somebody from flying. Because if we increase the price of a ticket by, I don't know, $20 uh, or 20 euros, um, that's not going to stop most people from buying that ticket. Uh, but if the price of the ticket increases by 200, 300, 500 uh, dollars or euros, that's when people are actually going to, um, when it's going to start affecting demand. So I think that's why a frequent flyer levy is, I think, such an interesting measure because it's also, it is progressive. So it would be, each additional flight will become exponentially more expensive to the point where it's almost, yeah, you know, completely impossible to, to buy the ticket uh, eventually. Um, right, and Don does have a question uh, and ask you to elaborate a little bit more about the frequent flyer levy. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I just, again, as a shout out to Stay Grounded, whose report I, uh, I highlighted in my presentation, uh, they have a, um, a whole discussion of the frequent flyer levy. Um, I think they're also looking into it in more detail. Um, now and and the effects of the frequent flyer lobby uh, and how it can be implemented um and i think exactly as you're saying currently frequent flyers are being rewarded for more travel through frequent flyer programs and you know these different loyalty programs where the more you fly the more the cheaper your flying becomes so basically a frequent flyer levy is almost like the opposite of a frequent flyer program um so um the more you fly, the, the the less you're incentivized to fly. So I think that's that's also a really great uh, kind of aspect um, to counter the frequent flyer programs. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's the more questions coming uh, from Ron. Did you have any stats on the voluntary involvement and in CO2 emission credits offered by the airlines? Yeah, I, well, this is uh, related uh, to the carbon offsetting approach, which is very much, um, as far as I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think, uh, and I, that's, uh, well, um, very much a green growth sort of uh, measure that I think is more of a distraction from 
uh, from more meaningful climate policy. So there's no way that paying, you know, some really insignificant amount of, uh, of money to offset your, uh, your flight is actually the correct, or, you know, if it's actually a, a meaningful, uh, contribution. So I think, um, this is really more of a distraction than, than something that's actually meaningful. Um, Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Super nice to, to have you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, yeah, so uh, I did speak to a few uh, representatives of uh, rail companies and a lot of people, of course, advocate for um, for uh, trains. And that's actually one of the one of the benefits of um, taxing aviation more heavily, because currently, as I mentioned, compared to other sectors, aviation is very much undertaxed. So by actually taxing aviation more uh, meaningfully, it would create more of a level playing field with other sectors, such as rail, the rail industry, which would make uh, traveling by rail more also financially appealing. Um, and we could also use revenue from uh, something like a frequent flyer levy or, or some other um, yeah, like taxation uh, mechanism to actually invest in the development of rail infrastructure. So uh, absolutely, those are very much um, closely uh, closely connect connected. Indeed, we have more questions. And actually, I just wanted to also add that for those who perhaps missed part of Anya's presentation or joining us a little bit later or watching a replay, uh, we will be posting a link to her thesis, which has been officially published, right, Anya, on the Utrecht University uh, in the library of, uh, uh, and then, yeah, it will be, a, it, it is available, uh, publicly available. Yeah. And yeah, I'll post that comment uh, in all of the social media that we are on, so you can always access it at any time later. Yeah, one more question from Dawn about professional flying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, uh, Don. Because I think uh, corporate travel is a really interesting uh, area, and in this transport and environment report that I also highlighted, which I think there was a, a, a link shared to that as well about the roadmap to climate neutral aviation. They very much emphasize the importance of a reduction in corporate travel, um, especially as COVID uh, showed us that it is possible to uh, live without. Uh, flying to, for, for work, that it's possible to do a lot of things online. Um, and I do think, I, I, yeah, I think the idea that, that people are flying to COP, the, these, uh, yeah, the COP events is quite um, counterproductive. Uh, I, I personally would like to see um, uh, more, uh, yeah, sort of development of, of more um, kind of online virtual uh, uh, working instead of uh, actually always having to be physically present for for co corporate meetings and things like that so um, uh, yeah so I, I think that's a, that's a really important area of focus uh, and of course a lot of the uh, a lot of business travelers are also uh, traveling business class uh, which is also uh, has a much higher contribution to overall co2 emissions than somebody tra traveling in economy class so I think that's a an important thing to, to mention as well. Um, yeah, and I uh, yeah, thanks for your comment, Don, as well. Uh, I think I think that's um, yeah, definitely something that that should be considered is how to use the revenues from from uh, taxing aviation to actually invest in alternative modes of transport transportation as well. Um, one question from Ron, and that was actually something that I was uh, almost about to ask. It's about the technological innovations and improvements and what role uh, they can play in the context of the growth of uh, aviation. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. So uh, again, I'll, I'll refer to the, the report by Transport and Environment, uh, where um, basically their argument uh, that they make in that report is that the current state of, of technological advancement uh, in aviation is not um, so basically technology is not going to contribute to meaningful reduction in the climate impacts of aviation within the coming decade which is why we need demand uh, management uh, efforts being made but there is the potential for uh, technology eventually to uh, get to the point where it is contributing meaningfully to climate uh, to to 
I mean, climate neutral aviation or, or a reduction in um, uh, the climate impact of the sector. So basically what Transport and Environment argues in their report, um, uh, which I, I also recommend to read, but uh, is that uh, it's, it's in the industry's interest as well, it, based on kind of long term ideas to, um, to support uh, maybe a reduction in aviation now and invest in, in um, or really promote you know, policies that uh, support the development of, uh, of technologies that would reduce the climate impacts of the sector so that in the long term, there, there could be space for, again, green growth of aviation, um, sort of in, you know, after 20, 2030, 2040. However, I also know that the degrowth argument uh, would be that we need to just in general rethink our relationship to travel and, and mobility. And currently we are, um, we're kind of used to the idea of being able to travel, you know, be on the other side of the world within a day. Uh, and we live these, live these very hyper mobile lifestyles where you can just fly somewhere for a weekend. Um, and I think uh, if we really, you know, take the degrowth argument in full, it would, it would really promote um, thinking about travel differently and, and um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, moving more towards more mindful kind of slower travel um, uh, in general. So um, I think that's also important to think about. Thanks, Anya. We have a comment and a question from uh, Ardak uh, Akanov. Ardak, thank you so much uh, for, for tuning in. Great to have you here with us. So here's a question. And again, it's about business travel versus economy travel. Yeah. Uh, well, as far as I understand, I think well, business class tickets also cost a lot more um, uh, money. So you're basically you're, you're sort of supporting the aviation industry more by buying uh, a business class ticket. Um, you're, it's also um, they take up a lot more space within the aircraft. So if we had less space for business class, we would um, have more space for, you know, economy class, which would allow more. Uh, passengers on one aircraft, which would have a, a lower per capita climate impact. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the main ways that I, I see business class being more, you know, problematic in terms of, of climate. Thank you. Yeah, and Don uh, again uh, elaborates on uh, technological improvements. Yeah, I think. Uh, Absolutely. And I also think that um, we also have to keep in mind that a lot of these, uh, you know, carbon neutral technologies that are also promoted for aviation uh, require re renewable energy. And if we continue growing the amount of aviation, then the amount of renewable energy would actually be required to um, meet current demand or, or projected demand would be so it would be sort of unfathomable. And of course, other sectors are also competing for would be competing for the renewable energy, um, which is why again it's important I think to to continue investing in technologies, but also reduce demand in order for the technologies to actually make a meaningful contribution to reducing the climate impact of the sector. The same goes for fuel efficiency improvements. Yes, fuel efficiency for aviation has gotten a lot better over the years. However, it has always been offset by an increase in aviation activity. So fuel efficiency, and especially now, it's becoming more and more difficult to make uh, significant improvements in fuel efficiency. Um, so it really, fuel efficiency is, is, is great, increasing the fuel efficiency, but we also have to decrease aviation activity in order for that to have a, a, an impact on, on the actual, uh, yeah, the climate impact of the sector. Thank you, Anya. Uh, well, as we are uh, perhaps waiting for a few more questions uh, uh, from our wonderful audience, thank you so much, everybody, for watching and for uh, becoming so engaged in this uh, very interesting conversation. Uh, perhaps I have a more like a, a, a general question. Uh, what inspired you to focus on degrowth uh, in, in, in your research? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, well, in general, I uh, became interested in degrowth during my master's study. This was a concept that I was introduced to very briefly during one of my sort of uh, 
early master's courses in my in my program and um, I was immediately intrigued because it was uh, kind of very different from the usual yeah as I mentioned kind of green growth approach and it immediately felt kind of intuitively correct to me so I, I looked more into it um, and then I was actually part of a, a group of uh, students within my master's program who we developed our own course on degrowth because this was something that we felt was missing from our study program. Um, so we decided that, I mean, luckily we had the opportunity to actually do this, to develop a, a tailor-made course um, and uh, and actually earn university credit for that. So we, we were a group of nine students and we developed our own curriculum, our own syllabus. We had some wonderful mentors um, throughout that process. And uh, so that was kind of another opportunity that I had to delve more into the topic. I was actually, I was also in Brussels last year in May for the Beyond Growth Conference at the European Parliament, where a lot of really prominent degrowth um, thinkers and, and researchers and speakers were present. Um, so I've just, in general, become really interested in, in in moving beyond growth in general, but specifically the degrowth movement. Um, and uh, so I, I kind of knew that for my research, I wanted to focus, or my, my, my thesis research, I wanted to focus on, on that as well. And in general, now I'm also, as I'm look more, moving towards the next stage, uh, so the post-university stage of my life, I also would love to continue um, yeah, working within a degrowth paradigm uh, and, and seeing how I can, uh, yeah, sort of con continue contributing to moving the world in that direction. Thank you so much. Uh, well, Sarah is asking now about um, European aviation industry versus U.S. aviation industry, because you mentioned that, so please elaborate on this question. Uh, well, actually, um, so I am not... Uh, because I was focusing on European aviation, I'm not super familiar with the U.S. aviation industry. Um, uh, what I what I was trying to say was that uh, the European aviation sector, compared to other sectors in Europe, is one of the most uh, has the largest some, one of the the largest kind of oppositions to climate uh, policy. So uh, again, I really recommend checking out uh, those reports by Influence Map. I'm also happy to share some links to those if if people would be would find those interesting. Um, I'd have to to find find the links, but um, uh, basically, uh, I, I think the term that they use in, in the reports is that the, Euro the European aviation sector is a, a laggard compared to other sectors in terms of their climate policy engagement. Uh, but this is specifically comparing aviation to other sectors within Europe. So I'm not actually sure how European aviation compares to U.S. aviation, but I would speculate that U the U.S. aviation sector is not great either. <laughs> I can imagine so. Yeah, with with the frequent flyer programs and uh, yep, it's contributing a lot. Uh, um, one yeah, ask has a question about if you have any examples of the governments. Yeah, so so some examples, examples of of governments um, implementing some aviation policy. Uh, for example, France has uh, made some progress in terms of limiting um, short haul flights. Um, uh, be, and uh, in the Netherlands, the Dutch government has has made uh, efforts to limit the number of flights at, at uh, Schiphol Airport in, in Amsterdam, uh, which is a really big uh, in the international um, uh, hub for for aviation. Um, uh, however, again, these efforts have been met with a lot of uh, industry pushback, and uh, as far as I as far as I know, um, they have been very much watered down, if not abandoned completely, um, a lot a lot of the time. Whenever a, a government tries to make some more radical, uh, you know, policy uh, changes in the direction of degrowth, uh, the aviation industry basically doesn't allow that to happen. Which is again why I think aviation industry lobbying is such a key, uh, yeah, intervention point, um, because. Uh, yeah, <laughs> even if, if, if governments have, have good intentions and actually try to make certain changes, as long as the corporations have that much power, it's going to be very, very hard to, to, yeah, get the radical change that we're looking for. I agree with that, certainly. Uh, we have a very nice comment here from Dawn, who has been listening to your presentation and uh, about also 
your journey and how you started focusing more on degrowth in your studies and in your life. And Dawn is saying that she would like to have you talk at the workshop that she will be giving later this year. So this is wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, Dawn. We really appreciate you being here with us. And well, certainly, if you, uh, I'm sure Anya will be happy to uh, give another Absolutely. talk on, yeah. on this topic or any other related topics. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that comment. And I, I'd love to get in touch about that workshop. Um, in general, I always, I, I love any opportunity to talk about uh, degrowth and kind of spread spread the word. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for that for that invitation. Thanks, Don. Well, uh, we've got yeah, quite a few questions. So again, thank you to everyone who's been uh, posting and um, we still have a little bit of time. So please feel free uh, to post your comments or more questions. And uh, meanwhile, as, as we're waiting perhaps for more um, input, uh, I just wanted to ask Anya, well, given everything that you've already talked about and the questions that you answered, how do you uh, envision the future of travel uh, in light of your research and, and your findings? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a good question. I, I, I touched a little bit on, on, on this idea of the paradigm shift already, and I think that's really important. I think it's not just about, you know, reducing flying because we, like, have to, but also maybe, um, yeah, just rethinking how we sort of live uh, in the world and, 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 uh, and how what role travel plays in our lives. I think very, currently... Travel is very much destination oriented and we want to get to our destination as fast as possible. But I think if we would, for example, travel more by rail uh, rather than, than, than planes, um, it would be a little bit more about the actual journey of getting somewhere and maybe sort of, um, yeah, being okay with, with the journey taking a little bit longer. And perhaps instead of going, you know, to the other side of the world for a weekend, um, going, taking a bit of a longer uh, time to get somewhere, but actually staying there longer as well. So um hopefully also with with uh, an increase in the op in opportunities to work remotely and uh again um re reducing corporate travel and and uh hopefully that will also give us the opportunity to not you know have to be in one place all the time and give us more flexibility in in how we travel um i think it's also about um being in, kind of enjoying our local environment environment more so if we're going on a holiday not necessarily having to fly to um some tropical island somewhere but maybe actually making use of uh our local environment and um enjoying holidays somewhere closer by that's reachable by by train for example um so i i really think we we need to reconsider uh how we travel and how we engage with um with with travel in general uh I, I something i didn't really mention because my research was very much focused on you know reducing the climate impacts of aviation but um aviation is also a really really high uh, highly unequal mode of transportation so only 10 percent of the global population has ever been on a plane um uh, even with the advent of, of low-cost uh aviation so uh it is very much an elitist mode of transportation um and uh, I think that's also something, yeah, we need to to consider. And that's why degrowth, uh, stay grounded, advocates for a um, uh, for degrowth as basically the only also socially just, uh, you know, uh, um, opportunity for aviation. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I I think we need to really think about it on a more of a paradigm level. Right. And this, of course, this discussion about whether to travel or not and wh where to travel and for how long has been coming up even in our well, personal family life. As Annie and I are on different continents, she's been living for quite a while, already five years and studying in the Netherlands. And I'm based in the United States. And of course, the issue of traveling, uh, well, is important. We want to see each other. But honestly, every time especially now that Anya has been so deeply involved in the idea and the philosophy and approach of, of degrowth. We've been talking about this uh, more about what 
is more sustainable and uh, if we do travel then for how long and is it really a necessity of course seeing a family we we, we came to a conclusion that perhaps seeing a family is uh, a very important thing right Anya that it's uh, justifies a certain travel but still this conversation comes up uh, every time we are considering a vacation um, yeah, and I, I just, just to, to touch on that, I think, uh, well, actually, one of the reasons I chose to focus on aviation specifically is because of how personal it is to me as well, as you mentioned, um, being on a different continent from, from my, my family and sort of being for, like, having to fly in order to see my family. And this uh, is something that also came up in my research. There's this idea of the social lock-in that happens when um, we sort of have a lot of people have come to structure their lives around uh, the availability of, of affordable air travel. So people are, have moved away from their close family with the expectation that they'll be able to kind of go back uh, whenever they, they want to. Um, and that is kind of, uh, I mean, on the one hand, ideally we would just live closer to our families. We wouldn't have to fly to see our family. But on the other hand, I mean, yeah, I've I've built a life already, um, you know, on a different continent, and it's 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 there are barriers to me, um, let's say, moving back uh, to live closer to my family, you know. So I, I think that's really where this social lock-in comes in, which is another la layer of complexity that makes it hard. That, that yeah, that's that makes you know a degrowth transition um, hard, and I, I totally recognize it, and I, I'm not you know judging people who do fly. Um, uh, I, I just think it's it's really an important conversation to have, um, and at least just to recognize that yeah, we need to reduce how much we fly. But again, I think it's maybe starting with more of the low hanging fruit, like corporate air travel, where really there isn't like there are definitely alternatives to flying to a conference for a weekend. You know, you can just join it join online, for example. So I think um, maybe we can start with some of the more low hanging fruit, and then gradually progress to the more sort of uh yeah kind of complicated uh areas right and i also of course have to say that we are very privileged in this way that we can travel just like you said uh most of the world they don't have this uh this privilege and uh, they are where they are they usually uh, grow grow up in one place and kind of stay there. So this whole uh, concept of air travel back and forth from one continent to another is really mostly privilege of uh, the rich countries, the, the global north. Uh, and uh, of course this contributes to, in a negative way to the climate change, which is very unfair, so it's very unjust. I think we have one more comment. From... Can I actually just related mm -hmm. to that point? I wanted to. This reminds me of something uh, of a quote from the the report by Transport and Environment. Let me see if I can quickly pull it up. Um, but they say at one point. Oh yeah. So I, I'm I'm quoting now from from this report, the um, carbon uh, the roadmap to climate neutral aviation in Europe, um, which we also shared the link to. But there it states. Um, the climate problem of flying is very much a wealthy European one. Well, here it says European, I would say just a wealthy, a one of, of the, yeah, right. the wealthy populations. Um, if everyone on earth flew like the wealthiest 10% of Europeans do, aviation would emit 23 gigatons of CO2 per year, two thirds of global CO2 emissions in 2019. So this again shows that uh, how, yeah, first of all, unequal aviation is and how uh, how much of a climate impact it actually you know, would have if, if it were to be uh, equal, which is why we need to, I think, yeah, we need to uh, reduce how much we fly instead of trying to make it more accessible to um, to other parts of the world. Right, and before, uh, well, Don had a question, but let me just post this comment from Ron, uh, who's been traveling quite a bit internationally, as far as I know. And yeah, so he's saying that he's experienced journeys with, uh, nearly empty uh flights yeah that's and that's also the case and, and there's actually a very interesting paper uh, about the business model of uh of, of of airlines and how um it's currently based on 
really high volume growth with very low profit margins. And basically the, the authors of the paper argue for maybe a different uh, business model. Um, but, but yes, absolutely. Um, sometimes flights fly at a very low occupancy. I'm not an entire, I'm not sure to what extent, like how big of an issue this is. I think most of the time, um, I mean, during COVID, of course, it was a different uh, situation when, yeah, planes were flying just like completely empty sometimes. But um, I think in general, um, yeah, flights are relatively full, um, at least in Europe. But uh, but I, I do think it's, yeah, it would be um, important to rethink the, the whole business model of the aviation industry in general. Right. And perhaps there is some room for government regulation of this as well, just like Ron mentioned. Well, I want to go back to this question from Don uh, about uh, cruising across the Atlantic. Uh, well, uh, to be honest, I'm not completely sure uh, about the carbon footprint of cruising. I mean, I think cruises in general, as far as I know, um, have a pretty high environmental impact. Um, so, um, so that's something I'd, I would have to um, look into. Um, yeah, but 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 again, I think maybe starting with the the low hanging fruit of uh, places where rail infrastructure is available. So, for example, like within Europe, it's uh, possible to get around on train by train. It's just sometimes um, not as convenient as flying, or at least it's not being perceived as being as convenient. It's more expensive. Again, for the reasons I said I stated before about aviation being a tax exempt uh, a lot of the time. So I think. Um, we need to maybe start in, in areas where alternatives are like really uh, good alternatives are available to aviation and uh, and actually uh, focusing on that first and then maybe thinking about uh, opportunities of, uh, you know, when we're yeah traveling across the Atlantic, how to address that. Um, I mean, personally, I, I kind of think that if we reduce corporate travel, if we um, reduce flying, you know, reduce short haul flights or ban short haul flights. If we, um, yeah, really invest in rail infrastructure and, and make it a, a, a really viable alternative to uh, aviation, uh, like intercontinental, like not intracontinental uh, aviation, then maybe there would still be some space left over for flying where there isn't a great alternative. So, yeah, like across the ocean. Um, so uh, that's why I think, yeah, sort of the, the low hanging fruit is, is important to see and see how much kind of, of a budget we have left over. Right. Um, well, yes, yeah, Sarah, yeah, thank you for your, for your comment. Yes, I will be posting the link to Anya's thesis uh, in the comments to this live stream. Uh, and uh, yeah, it will be available. Uh, for reading. It is uh, in very interesting, uh, quite complex, uh, which is, of course, because it's uh, it's based on a lot of research. And actually, as we still have a few minutes uh, before we need to wrap up, I wanted to go back to a little bit to this uh, quite complex approach that Anya took, uh, the, the systems a thinking approach and perhaps ask you, Anya, how do you think this approach can contribute to the degrowth discourse in in general? Yeah, so um, it, it, there was recently a review that was uh, published that looked at uh, degrowth policy in general, uh, like looked at all these degrowth policy proposals in the academic literature. Uh, and found that uh, a lot of the times degrowth policies, uh, so they, they found this issue of policy dropping, which refers to policies being mentioned um, in the literature without really being analytically connected to the issues that they're trying to address. So it creates this um, problem where perhaps the policies that are mentioned, the degrowth policies that are mentioned more often in general, not just for aviation, but across sectors, uh, are are men, are more popular simply because they've been referenced before, but not maybe these might not be actually the most high impact changes uh, or high impact policies. Um, so the the authors of this review really, you know, they advocate for um, 
for more of an kind of analytical approach and really uh, sort of a more thoughtful selection of the policies that are actually being promoted uh, in, in the degrowth discourse. Uh, which is where the systems thinking approach comes in, because as I, uh, well, I didn't have a chance to really elaborate on the causal loop diagram, but um, looking at the, the issue and looking at the intricacy, intricacies of the issue and how the different variables affect each other and how, what are actually the key factors that are driving an issue, that really helps us pinpoint which policies are actually the most effective um, in addressing a certain issue rather than um, just mentioning policies because they're popular and everybody talks about them. Um, and perhaps those are one and the same. Perhaps the most popular policies are also the ones that are the most effective, but perhaps we'll be surprised. Uh, and, and it turns out that something that has been kind of under uh, emphasized in the literature turns out to be more significant than we had originally thought. So I think systems thinking can be a really useful tool in degrowth discourse in general, especially degrowth policy discourse. Uh, which is also something I, I sort of try to emphasize in my thesis. Thank you very much, Enya. Uh, well, we're getting comments uh, with a comment from Ardak, thanking you for this, uh, all this valuable information. Then I want to thank Ardak for being here with us and participating. And uh, Dawn is very kind to say that this was a great way to kick off International Women's Day, which is, of course, coming uh, up very soon on March 8th and uh, will be celebrated in you know, many countries. And I agree. <laughs> I haven't even thought about it, but it is great that Anya uh, uh, can, can be here at the, uh, on the first day of, of spring and um, yeah, talk about this uh, important, important topic Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you uh, for being here with us. Thank you for uh, participating, asking your great questions and uh, inspiring this, this dialogue. I'm sure there is, could be a lot more that we could talk about. I know Anya was ready to go deep into the causal uh, loop that she created, which looks uh, very complicated, and she put a lot of uh, thought and ideas into this, uh, but it's, it might be a little bit too technical for this broadcast. So again, I welcome you to read her thesis if you are interested in more detail of her approach. And uh, uh, meanwhile, I think we are nearing the end of the hour, and as I am... Um, the one handling the technical side, I'm going to put some uh, announcement uh, for the upcoming episode because, as you know, we are here live uh, on the first day of each month, and the next one, uh, of course, will be coming on April 1st. We will be announcing the speaker and the topic shortly, so please uh, uh, tune in and check our social media and the website for more information. And uh, for today, I would like to, again, to thank everyone uh, for joining us. And of course, special thank you to our inspiring speaker, Anya Al-Salem, for sharing her findings uh, on the research and enlightening us uh, on uh, the growth and the future of aviation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's episode of Consulting Without Borders Perspectives. Again, stay tuned uh, for more announcements for our upcoming episode on April 1st. And uh, just please know that we sincerely appreciate each and every one of you. I look forward to seeing you again on uh, April 1st. And if we don't have any more comments, I will be wrapping up here. So again, I'm wishing you uh, all a fantastic first months of spring, wherever you are. Take care and goodbye. Thank you, Anya. Thank you.